Good evening. My name is Casey Monda, as Julie just said. Um, I am an art advisor and art historian located here in Chagrin Falls, and I am thrilled to be here tonight to celebrate this amazing exhibition put on by Beck and her colleagues. I am um, honored to be the first in what I hope to be a series of programming around the Valley Art Center's exhibitions. Um, so I think it goes without saying that talking about art and art history is like one of my favorite things to do. Um, and so tonight I'm really excited to get to sort of don my art history cap once again and share with you a little bit about the history of surrealism, um, where we started with surrealism then, and how we got to where we are today and maybe put into context a little bit of what we see on the walls. To you, and, and, um, and then of course we'll get to the stars of the show, and we can talk a little bit about these original etchings by Salvador Dali, um, and perhaps talk about um, collecting prints by um, masters, big known, um, big known artists, um, collecting works on paper, some of the issues surrounding that, and of course we'll have time for questions. So I think everybody comes to the table of surrealism with some maybe notion or preconception of what that art might have looked like in its heyday in the early 20th century, right? We have Dali's melting clocks that are on coffee mugs and umbrellas the world over. Um, of course, Magritte's apple-faced gentleman that is a fairly ubiquitous image that was sort of recast a million times during COVID with all sorts of masks and all sorts of things. Um, but I think what maybe a lot of people don't necessarily have a, a notion of or a preconception of is why this art looks the way that it does. What was the historical context for why the artist felt that this was the right visual language to speak at this moment in time? Um, I had a, a professor in art history, my very first art history professor, was always stressing for us the why. Why does an image look the way that it does, right? Um, and I'm not saying that we should necessarily um, look at all of our history or paint all of our history with a brush dipped in the colors of historical events, um, but it's one way to sort of think about the art that was created in a particular period, why the artists um, used a particular visual language or a particular set of ideas to inform the way that they made um, images and perhaps helps us understand a little bit about the way um, that artists are working today. So, Surrealism's heyday was about 1924 to 1940, so more or less the sort of intra-war years, the years between World War I and World War II. Um, it's often described as an offshoot of Dada um, because the founder of the Surrealist, Andre Breton here, was a member of the Dada group. Um, the Dadaists were um, really reacting to um, the horrors and atrocities of World War I, right? This was a world war on a scale that no one had ever even fathomed before, right? You had all these new types of weapons. You had mass casualties on a scale that had never happened before. Many of these artists actually served in the militaries of their, you know, their sort of respective militaries. They were an international group of guys um, and gals. Um, <clears throat> So they actually bore witness to the horrors of that war firsthand, and they come home and they are questioning everything, right? They, you know, if, if rational society, if the way, if modern decorum has kind of gotten us to this point, then how do we move forward? How do we not do that again? And so these artists were thinking about art through the same lens. Um, they were questioning everything and so they chose to make art that questioned the very foundations of art itself um, and I'm, I'm explaining Dada because I think it helps contextualize surrealism. So one of the most famous Dada sculptures um, is by Marcel Duchamp, The Fountain from 1917 um, and it is in fact a urinal turned upside down and signed with a fake artist name and put on a pedestal and he's calling it art, right? So you might disagree, and I would welcome the debate. I would love to talk to you about why or why not this is art. But Duchamp is leveraging the tropes of art history to question what it is we can and can't call art as a way to sort of grapple with what we what we call modern society and what we call um, 
call rational society, right? So what are those tropes of art history that he's sort of dealing with? And I'll quickly go through them. First of all, he's calling it a fountain. And if you think about Renaissance and Baroque art, right, the fountain is sort of the pinnacle of art making, right? An artist has really made it if he can make if he can be a sculptor of a fountain, right? You have Bernini's fountains that sort of litter the piazzas of Rome. You have the, the classical fountains of the Villa d'Este, right? These are, these are important, esteemed um, art historical sites. And Duchamp is saying, yeah, I made a fountain. This thing spews water, right? It's a fountain. Um, he also is using the right shape, that sort of um, triangular pyramidal shape um, that we see in Renaissance art. It's that stable, form of perhaps Michelangelo's Pietà, or the Trinity, or the Virgin and Child, and, the, and Leonardo da Vinci's paintings of that subject. Um, it's a revered, solid form. So Duchamp is saying, yeah, mine's the same, right? It's a fountain and it's pyramidal, all right? Two things. And it's also porcelain, just like these precious objects, these Chinese ceramics and Japanese ceramics. So you have medium, you have shape, you have the object itself, and yet it is literally a urinal that he found in like a thrift shop and turned it upside down and put it on the pedestal. Um, and so they're really grappling with what it is that we say is art and how we think about art. Now, oh, too far. Now, Andre Breton was a part of this movement, but he felt like at some point it sort of exhausted itself, right? It, they, they, they got about as far as they could go, and he felt like it needed to be push towards more political ends. Between the wars, right, we have um, sort of the rise of fascism, um, imperialism, colonialism, Mussolini and Hitler sort of stripping personal liberties of the, of the people right and left. Um, and Andre Breton wanted to use the language of Dada, this sort of um, questioning of society um, to, towards polit political ends. So he wanted to sort of position that against nationalism and the rise of the classical order under these government, um, under these government regimes. And so he started thinking about um, the subconscious. He was interested, he was a medical student actually interested in Freudian analysis and um, mental illness. Um, and so he started thinking about how if we no longer have the sort of freedoms that we once did under these new dictators, we could go to the subconscious and the imagination um, to sort of find that freedom once again, find where freedom truly exists in the subconscious and the imagination. Um, so surrealism actually started as a literary movement. Um, it was a group of poets and writers who would engage in these sessions of automatic writing where they would sort of let their mind kind of go free and, and, um, and write whatever came to them. And it sometimes resulted in some really violent um, right, violent encounters. Some guy like, pulled a gun on another guy because he said his subconscious was like going wild. Um, so they really, um, they really took them very, very seriously. Um, but because of this automatic writing and this sort of delving into the subconscious and the, the imagination and the irrational, the visual artists saw this as, a, as an apt visual language for what they were also trying to express. And so the images that we see come out of this time period from artists like Salvador Dali or um, Rene Magritte, for instance, um, are forcing us to engage with our own um, our own psyche in a, in a new way. So I've always been told, show, don't tell. So let's actually like look at some surrealist images, right? Um, first, I will, I will tell you, um, I will read a quote that from Andre Breton's first surrealist manifesto from 1924, because I think that really sets up the tone for how we can look at um, works by Dali and Degree, for instance. So he wrote in this manifesto that was published in 1924, this summer, roses are blue, the wood is of glass. The earth, draped in its verdant cloak, makes as little impression upon me as a ghost. It is living and ceasing to live that are imaginary solutions. Existence is elsewhere. So, how does Dali depict this existence that um, Raton claims is elsewhere? And I think one of the most famous surrealist images um, is The Persistence of Memory from 1931 by Dali. So this slide is a little bit deceiving because the painting itself is actually only about nine and a half inches tall by about 13 inches wide. So it's very small, very intimate, a sort of pinhole view into the art, artist's vast 
imagination, and subconscious. And I have to say, I feel like Dali's imagination was a very scary place. Um, so to deconstruct this, this image a little bit, um, you have your sort of classical landscape in the background, right? You have your, your body of water um, up against these sort of cliffs. Um, and you would typically think of a landscape as a cool, refreshing sort of image, right? You know, you can maybe think about the breeze in your hair, the smell of the salt water, or hear the waves sort of lapping on the shoreline. Um, but in Dali's iteration, it's still, it is eerily quiet. It's disquietingly quiet. Um, and it's witheringly hot in this image, right? Just, you can just like feel that oppressive heat on your body. So he sort of, for starters, upended everything that we kind of know about or think about when we look at a landscape painting. Then we move into the foreground and we really see that, that sort of oppressive heat um, in physical form. Um, even the clocks are sort of going limp and melting over the barren tree branch, sliding off the side of the table, melting over this sort of monstrous, monstrous melting face shape over over the rocks here, you can, I don't know how well you can see, but you have sort of an eyelid with eyelashes, a nose with a tongue sort of melting out of it. And so you have this sort of monstrous face um, that is somewhat rooted in reality, right? You can kind of see the elements of the face, um, but it's clearly not a real depiction of a profile. Um, these clocks sort of melting, responding to the environment, responding to the heat. Um, and then you have another time piece here um, this is a, a zoom in of that pocket watch, that gold pocket watch um, with the ants sort of crawling all over it, resembling, you know, deco de decomposing flesh. Um, putrefication and sexuality and violence were huge themes in Dolly's work. And of course, this, um, this painting has it in spades. Okay, so we've sort of deconstructed, we've kind of figured out what, um, what the image is. But how is this sort of responding to the politics of the time, right? Well, what is it that orders our society? What, what can we rely on no matter what? Time, right? Yes, exactly. So typically you think of time marches on, right? Nothing stops time. We live and die by the clock. Like we literally have to know what time somebody dies, right? But in this image, time responds to the environment just as humans respond to the environment. It goes limp and sort of melts and withers away um, into oblivion. So Dali is completely upending this structuring device that we rely on um, no matter what. And it's becoming, um, it's becoming just sort of part of the environment. It's going, it's, it's sort of just, you know, going away. He's deconstructing these um, and destabilizing the permanence that we assign to time in our civilized society. Um, but I also see in this painting um, Dolly's practice of the paranoid critical method, um, which was this um, system that he engaged in where we, he would allow his mind to just reach really, really sort of paranoid places and then he would paint what the images that he sort of conjured in this extraordinarily paranoid state. Um, and so I see here this sort of landscape of Dali's imagination where in your imagination and in your dreams and in your subconscious, time just goes away. Time is no longer of the essence in your imagination. Um, and so I almost see this as sort of an autobiographical um, landscape of, of Dali's subconscious where time is no longer there. And it's a very scary place where he is super paranoid um, and, and responding to, um, to these things that he's conjured in his mind. Um, so he, he places um, real, tangible objects that we think that we know into situations that are very unfamiliar to sort of upend our sense, our sense of normalcy and force us to question what it is that we believe in um, and what it is that we hold to be true and, and real. In a similar way, Rene Magritte also forces us to reckon with what it is that we know to be true and what, what is real in his Treachery of Images uh, painting from 1929. So in a, in a similar way to, the, to how Dali was um, pulling on art history with you know, sort of the, the landscape um, and this hyper-realistic representation of, um, of forms, uh, 
Magritte is doing this is doing something similar, leveraging the idea of trompe l'oeil, which is a sort of fancy French word for trick of the eye, um, where he renders this pipe in a hyper realistic style. Right, um, you can really feel the wood grain and the, the way the light reflects off the smoothness of the of the of the polished wood, forcing you to believe that this. 2D, the, this 2D rendering of a 3D object is the object itself. And then in um, a script that you might find in, in a school primer, right, where you sort of learn the basis of your education, um, this script, he's written, ceci n'est pas une pipe, which means this is not a pipe. So he's given you a pipe, and then he says this is not a pipe. So he's juxtaposing the image and the word and forcing us to think about where it is that we place our belief and what we hold to be true. Do we believe what we see? Do we believe what we hear? Do we believe what we read? What can we even believe anymore? And if you think about what was happening in the world at this time, how, what, where, where, what can we believe if not just turning, it, it, turning inward into our own subconscious, into our own imagination, into our own dreams, into our own mind, and finding our own truth and freedom with it? So we could look at art historical slides all day, but right now we are in a gallery of wonderful paintings, and so I want to turn our attention to the work on the wall now. And I have put slides of the work up so that if you don't want to turn in your seat, you don't have to. Um, but this painting is actually on the back wall back there, and I would encourage you all um, at the conclusion of the lecture to go look at it because it is a fabulous painting and I think a wonderful continuation of this legacy of surrealism. So the artist here has set up a real, um, a, a painting of oppositions, right? I think there's some very obvious oppositions, um, the first of which perhaps is these, um, these teardrops against this more painterly um, backdrop and landscape, right? These are sort of graphic design, highly designed, sort of modern looking shapes that suggest a teardrop against a very painterly landscape of this sort of desert red rocks. And that inherently is an opposition, right? The water in the desert. Um, and then this water, this sort of body of water here overflowing over the, um, <clears throat> over the, the skull as a waterfall and dripping down in here. So you have the water in the desert, you have um, the, the stylistic oppositions of the teardrops and the painterly or um, more naturalistic renderings of the other figures. Um, you have um, this, uh, this mouth there in the, in the middle that I have to admit, the first time I walked into the gallery and saw this painting, I, was, I wondered if it was a, uh, an enlarged photograph of a mouth. I had to actually get up close and personal with it and make sure that it was painting and not like a photograph that was collaged on top, um, a, a collage on top of the painting. So you have um, this mouth that is sort of grappling for, um, for, for water perhaps or, 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 or singing. There, there's this um, sort of opposition of, um, uh, of sound and silence in the desert. Um, you also have the fish here that in itself is an oppositional figure because he's been hooked, he's got um, the blood sort of dripping from the cut in his tail, and yet he's, his, his or her, I suppose, um, head is still submerged underwater and you have to get up close to see it, but you can see the sort of underpainting and underdrawing of the fish in the water. So the fish itself is existing in this liminal state between life and death. It's been caught, it's been hooked, it's about to get yanked out of the water, but it's taking its last breath underwater um, before, um, before he's, he's caught. So this fish sort of exists in this, liminal, in this liminal state, this sort of opposition of life and death. My favorite opposition, which is not as readily apparent, but I'm very excited about, um, is, this, um, is this fleshy figure up here at the top. So I'm going to set up this opposition as flesh versus marble because the artist here is actually referencing um, a very famous Bernini sculpture, which I, when I first saw the painting, I was like, I, you can see the way that the, you can see the indents of the flesh around the fingers, the way, it's, the, way the hands are sort of pushing into the, into the skin. And this is like what Bernini is famous for, that he can make marble look like flesh. And I immediately thought of this paint, this sculpture by Bernini called The Abduction of Proserpina, um, which is a 
depiction of the god Hades pulling Proserpina down into the underworld. So in this sculpture, Proserpina is in that liminal state between life and death. She's exiting the world of the living and descending into the underworld. And so for me, this painting feels like a, um, a metaphor perhaps for the fact that as we are living, we are also dying. We too exist in the liminal state, but as the fish does, as Proserpina did, that as we live our lives, as we are living, we are, we are also dying. And I think that that idea is reinforced um, by the presence of the skull here, um, which is a typical representation uh, or a typical symbol of what we call a memento mori in art history. Um, if you um, look at Dutch still life from the 17th century, sometimes in like flower paintings from Tulip Mania from the Netherlands in the 1700s, you might see a skull. Um, and that's often the artist's reminder to us that you can have all of these things and all of this beauty, but you can't take it with you and you're going to die. Um, and so they'll like put a skull in the still life of all of these beautiful things, just like, just remember, you're going to die too. Um, and so I feel like the artist here is, is sort of reminding us of that. How are you living your life? What is it that you're spending your time on? What are you doing in this, in this time? Because as that, in that slow march to death, that's life. That's where you get, that's where you get to live. Um, obviously I really love this painting. <laughs> um, so I want to turn our attention now. We can move up to this front corner of the gallery. Um, in a similar way, um, this artist, do you want to turn some lights on over here? Can we, can we some lights? Just so people can see. Um, this artist is sort of also engaging in this legacy of placing familiar objects and familiar scenes in sort of an unfamiliar um, situation. So the title of the work is Hardy Bowl of Clouds. Um, and I think we can all see that um, from a, a sort of eater's eye, bird's eye view of the bowl, the, the figure here is sort of clutching on one side, about to take that first um, that first bite of a hearty bowl of something, right? Um, you, would, you, you might, as you're looking at it, think about a time when you had a hearty bowl of stew. You might have think of feelings of nostalgia, of warmth, of fulfillment, of comfort. Um, but here the artist has filled the bowl with literally nothing, right? Clouds, vapory wisps of insubstantial nothingness, um, which the clouds in and of themselves are a little non mimicry, which I kind of love. Um, but I think that the artist is setting up for us um, a metaphor for our consumer culture um, and the fact that um, we often dedicate our energies and our time and our money towards things that um, are insubstantial and in, inconsequential, right? How do we um, how do we spend our time? Where do we put our um, put our time uh, and our and our energy in, in life? And I also kind of think that there's a a little bit of social media identity culture wrapped up um, in in this painting and sort of questioning. Um, what we think we know to be real because we see photographs of things online and what is actually backing up those photographs and, and sort of what we see as real versus what is actually real and happening um, sort of you know, in, a person, in a person's life and the, the images that they're putting forward on social media. So this artist is actually is, is a very young artist, but I think she's very elegantly set up um, a scene for us where we can start to question um, sort of the things that we hold to be solid and substantial versus things that are sort of ephemeral and, and inconsequential. Um, we can move right down here and I'll put a bigger version of it up so you can see on the back. Um, so the, the little sculpture down here is called Birdie Woman by an artist named Delaney Weibel who just um, graduated from Sugar Falls High School, so she's 18, which I think bears mentioning because Incredible, an incredible work and an incredible statement on sort of womanhood and femininity in the 21st century. Um, but when I, this was admittedly a late addition to the lecture, but I just couldn't not look at it um, because I really wanted to put her sort of in line with um, the projects of Merit Oppenheim from the 1930s. She was a female surrealist um, working with Dali and all of those guys in, 
in Paris. And her work, um, rather than sort of attacking, you know, fascism and colonialism and imperialism, um, was more um, focused on um, femininity and womanhood and, and issues, um, or issues around women in that time. Um, and I think that it, her work can get very aggressive. And I think Delaney's work is a much softer um, version of it. Um, but I think that Delaney here is um, sort of juxtaposing differing um, depictions of females throughout our history to sort of beg the question of how females are depicted now. Um, so the first image I thought of when I looked at this was the Venus of Willendorf, which is, I think, the very first object I ever looked at as a freshman at Davidson in my first art history class, it's sort of the first thing that you look at um, as this sort of very, very early depiction of women. Um, we don't know that much about it, but we do um, surmise that because of the sort of emphasized um, anatomical parts associated with fertility and childbearing, that there's some sort of goddess of fertility and childbearing, a celebration of femininity and womanhood in the culture um, from whence it came. And I think we can sort of see the direct um, visual links between that sculpture and this, and this little, little guy here. And then the second thing I thought of on the completely opposite end of the spectrum was the Nike of Samothrace, it's now in the Louvre, which was a, a Greek sculpture of, um, of a goddess sort of on the prow of a ship. It's a celebration of uh, you know, female perfection and strength, and she's a goddess, and she's leading this, leading this ship. Um, and so we have two very, very different depictions of the female figure in history that I feel like Delaney has really elegantly married in this, um, in this image. And then she calls it birdie woman. And I had to think a little bit about this whole bird aspect of things. Um, but for me, I, I was led down a path of thinking about the way the female form is celebrated now and what is, um, what is considered beautiful in our own time. And it's obvious, oftentimes very different from um, the two cultures that we have just looked at, right? We value um, height and, and thinness and sort of sharp, harsher features. Um, and I feel like that, that she's sort of nodding to that sort of bird-like, twig-like um, form that is often associated with the female um, figure now. And then I started thinking about where are the juxtapositions, right? Because this is all females. There's not a lot of juxtaposition. And for me, it was the juxtaposition of weight, heaviness, and lightness, right? The, the, um, the body itself feels, um, has a certain sort of like gravity and weight to it. It feels like it's sort of being pulled down. And yet these wings are going to have to make it launch. It's going to have to pull it up off of off of the pedestal, this, this body is going to, is going to soar. And I, and I started thinking about what it is that pulls us down and what it is that allows us to soar and sort of these burdens and issues um, that, um, that women deal with today. So, you know, for an 18 year old, I felt like it was a very elegant portrayal of women's issues in our, in our, current, um, in our current moment. So, now we can turn to the stars of the show. Um, and I, let's see, what time is it? I may stop there and let everyone come and take a look at them and ask some questions because that worked really well in the last in the last session. Um, and I'm happy to sort of give my spiel about them, but it might be helpful to even actually come up and take a look at them. So um, I'm going to stop talking, let everyone get up and stretch their legs. Feel free to, to wander about the gallery, and, and I'll be up here to sort of talk about these guys and take questions. But, um, thank you very much for coming tonight. It's been a pleasure talking about surrealism. Thank you.